join with computer audio. It says record. Okay, it is 5.30 by my computer and I just started recording because we'll post this later. It looks like we mostly have staff here, but a couple parents, so that's great. Um, this, just as a reminder, every night of a board meeting at 5.30 for the foreseeable future, we're doing a community Q&A. Usually just we all go over a couple topics and then open it up to anybody that might have any questions. You can type them in the chat which hopefully is enabled. Um, Ms. Latham, could you send me a, tech, a test chat just to make sure that that's working? Or someone, Ms. Perrier? Ah, perfect. Okay, it is working. Okay, so three topics I wanted to go over. One, just kind of briefly discuss um, we def the Omicron surge, which we're definitely experiencing impact to students, um, staff, people associated uh, with our system. I'm looking at the email from our district nurse today. I'll kind of go through each building. Um, high school had five folks on quarantine or isolation with three of them being positive. Middle school had 11 out on quarantine or isolation with one positive. Uh, Vanita, 11 with three positive. Uh, Elmira Elementary, 30 in quarantine with five positive. So five, eight, nine, looks like 12 total positive. Um, there's probably more uh, that we just don't know about, of which four are staff. And as often happens, uh, four of the positives are staff. Some of the quarantines or isolations could be them as well when their kids' school is closed, even if they don't, you know, we have staff members that live in other places in Lane County. We have a few of staff who are out and their schools are closed altogether, um, uh, not necessarily to their student or child being sick, but not being in school due to a health issue. Their staff members are allowed to take sick leave. Uh, so we have folks out uh, for that as well. So definitely have more than just the four uh, staff members out. Um, so since the start of the pandemic, that's, you know, the last, since we came back after winter break, for sure, it has looked different for us. Um, the staff in buildings have been doing a fantastic job being creative, I will say, uh, flexible, um, and just doing lots of things to ensure that we continue to provide daily in-person instruction uh, every day uh, until we can't. And that's what we're continuing to do. That's the number one goal uh, to make it to June and have never had to close uh, school for even a two hour delay um, as a result of any health uh, COVID related issues. So I wanted to briefly talk about that. Um, I wanted to talk about you know a potential transition at some point, I hope, to um, allowing volunteers in the school. They would need to be vaccinated volunteers, uh, but also allowing unvaccinated folks uh, to come into the school, even if it's as simple as walking their kid to class. We had worked on a, on a kind of draft plan that we were gonna try um, before winter break, uh, spent some time on it, and we knew kind of what was coming. It was predicted that we were gonna have this surge, so it's just kind of on hold. But when we get to a spot where our numbers, you know, are back like they were in say late October, uh, early November, uh, that's something we hope to be able to do. Uh, so we're continuing to massage the language in that. And as we approach that opportunity, we're gonna take it as soon as we can. And the last thing I wanted to touch on before I turn it over to you if you have any questions, was just identified the day before winter break, OHA, ODE released a ton of changes um, and updates. And I wanted to just touch on a couple highlights of those. Uh, the number one uh, change that I'll note is the definitions of up-to-date uh, in vaccinations and how it relates to staff and students. For students, it didn't change. A student is up-to-date in their vaccination 
if they uh, completed two shot series or one shot if it was Johnson and Johnson and all of the quarantine isolation close contact rules apply to them, which are a lot better. They let them stay in school uh, absent any symptoms. For staff, they changed it to having a booster. So while having a booster isn't in the governor's mandate around employment, uh, it does, and let's say Gary's a staff member and I'm not boosted and I'm a close contact to somebody that's positive, uh, I now have to quarantine or isolate. While if Gary, the staff member, has had a booster shot and I'm a close contact, I do not need to quarantine or isolate unless I have symptoms. I need to be consistent with my mask use, et cetera. Um, so so that, that's a big change for us. It went from having every staff member in our district, no one, needing to isolate or quarantine unless they were sick or had someone sick in their house um, to only folks that were boosted. I don't, we're collecting data from our staff members that want to voluntarily give it to us. I haven't looked at it in three or four days, uh, but last time I did, I wanna say we were approaching, if not over 50% of our folks had at least reported that they got the booster. I'm sure it's a higher percent that actually have. Uh, so we're gonna to continue to collect that information. Um, the other big change that I wanted to mention that came out <clears throat> is there's no more close contacts in school uh, except for two settings, uh, eating, so cafeteria, or I suppose classroom if they're eating in the classroom or unmasked athletics. So <clears throat> what that tells us is if we're following all the general protocols in a given classroom, let's take second grade classroom with Ms. Marshall and um, a student tests positive. If we were following everything, no one else in the class needs to quarantine or isolate, just monitor for symptoms. Uh, however, if the close contact occurred at a time where we weren't following uh, protocols, then they would, or if it was a time at lunchtime uh, or unmasked athletics, which you know, we want to continue to provide athletics. We know it's important to our students, our families, the community. We're continuing to do that. Uh, and the, the last week or two have been much, much better in regards to participation of visitors to the gym and following the rules and wearing masks. So it's been great. I have no problem continuing. But amongst the student athletes, it's definitely uh, spreading more. So wrestlers or basketball players, um, a lot more testing positive, a lot more canceled games, just a result of uh, not being able to practice due to not enough players. Uh, so those were the three things I wanted to touch on, which I know wasn't a lot, but we only have a few folks here and I really want to give, uh, you know, it isn't so much about me telling you things you might not even care about as it is about if you have a specific question. When would be noted, would be, let me start over. Would we be notified if a child in our child's class tested a positive so that we could monitor more, close, more closely for symptoms? Ms. Marshall, are you on here? I am. Okay. I'm going to answer, but you jump in if I get off track. Okay. Um, I think we're not notifying in the class um, unless a parent, let's say, uh, what I would encourage parents to do is talk to their classroom teacher. So, um, Again, maybe it's a little easier at the elementary school level where they have one teacher. Uh, but if a parent, hey, I, I want to know any time uh, my student, you know, anyone that they associate with uh, tests positive, I think we, we could do that. But we're not charged, like we were at the beginning of the year, we were charged with doing that. We're not charged with doing that now. And it's such a workload uh, that it's overwhelming, especially now. It's much more manageable in September or October where we're making one or two phone calls a day but this could literally be two people, um, you know, all day long. What I would tell a parent is, especially with the way things are now, there's somebody positive in every classroom in our school district. And that might be an over-exaggeration, um, but I don't know if it's much of an over-exaggeration. There, there's positive people that don't, you know, have mild symptoms, um, don't get tested. Uh, so did I say anything? Way off base there, Ms. Marshall, from what you understand from our nurse? Uh, the only thing I would share is that even three months ago, we weren't notifying every time a child was positive in the class, only close contacts. So yeah. um, 
I think I would, would I would agree with you in the sense that if, if you really want to know, I would talk with the school and the teacher and then they would probably make a point. But with the new guidance that came out, we do not have to contact trace. So that's going to take quite a bit of workload off of our administrators and teachers. And if you were a close contact at lunch or athletics, then obviously you would be notified. Okay, good question though, because everything I just told you right there was different than 30 days ago. And I would imagine in 30 days from now, it's all gonna be different again. Um, the, the changes uh, in the guidelines that we continue to get are weekly, you know, in small scale and every month or two, it's the entire thing is reworked by what we're, what we're sent and, and told we need to enforce and do so. Um, but that's where we're currently at. Anybody else have any questions of any topic at all? While we're on here, I'll share one just because it's come up a lot recently um, that I get asked a lot is about board meetings and comments and public comment. And this is what I would say to that. Uh, first, you know, we've adopted new policy that actually makes it easier to make public comment. Now let's go back pre-pandemic. You know, you could show up at a board meeting, a sign in, um, say you could speak for three minutes, say whatever you wanted, as long as you weren't naming names or uh, express any opinion or concern. And, and um, now we've made it easier. Not only can you do that when you're in person, but when we come back to in, you can do it virtually. Um, and not only can you do it virtually, if you work at night when the board meetings happen, you could submit something um, and we could read it for you. So instead of, again, pre-pandemic, your only option was you had to come to the board meeting, you had to be in person. Now, when we hopefully return to in-person board meetings, um, you'll be able to do that. You need to let us know by one o'clock on the day of the board meeting. So you got a whole month to figure out if you're gonna do it. Um, or you could be at, you know, sitting on your couch and participate. Uh, or you could just send an email that you want read into the record and send it to Michelle by one o'clock on the day of the board meeting and we'll read it for you. Um, the other thing I would emphasize is just a reminder that a lot of folks get confused when they um, hear that our board meetings are, are public meetings and what that means. And what that means is that our board meetings are held in public that our school board does their work, uh, hears um, things that are going on in the district, gets updates, asks questions of the business manager or myself or principals, hears reports from buildings. Um, and they do all that when they meet, uh, they do it in public. Um, but what, it, it, what a board meeting isn't is an interactive process with the public. The public uh, doesn't come in and, um, you know, engage in Q and A's with the board and long-term discussion. They have an opportunity, uh, something our board doesn't need to do, but most boards, not all, most boards in the state of Oregon do allow for public comment. Um, so we have that at the start of our agenda uh, on any topic, but just a reminder to folks um, that, you know, as a result of the pandemic and going, going virtual, we hope that that allows people to engage more even though we only have a few people on here, probably if we were in person, you wouldn't be here. This makes it a lot easier. You can be at your house and participate in our meetings. And we're gonna continue that when we get back to in-person. So I wanted to share that. How does the district feel about the LC school district changing their mask? That is an excellent question. I read that the other day. I got it sent to me on Friday. Um, for those of you, that don't know what um, that question is about. Let me, since we have a few minutes and not very many people here, I'll read you what was sent out because it was texted to me. Essentially, um, I'll summarize because it's kind of long. The LC School District, which is a, a public charter school district just east of Corvallis, um, essentially, uh, thumb their nose, which I guess is a term I'll use it, OHA and ODE and say, we're not following the rules, we're not wearing masks. Um, interestingly enough, then their school was shut down. They didn't have school uh, today and tomorrow because they don't have enough staff. Uh, and that's what I would anticipate would happen here. 
um, I have a conference call with our Lane ESD superintendent tomorrow to ask, what is the recourse here? I mean, I got people in my community, um, some that, hey, if this is allowable in LC and they're not gonna uh, you know, start taking teachers licenses for not enforcing masks or administrators licenses or superintendents licenses or fining the school district, if there is no um, hammer, if there is no consequence here, I feel like that's something I need to let my school board and community know. There's other districts that have just said, heck, we're not doing this and, and uh, it doesn't matter. The, what, but as you can see already, it took, uh, this was released on Friday. It didn't even take till the next school day until there's, the staff responded and now they've shut down. Um, and that is what I would anticipate happens here. But I will get it, you know, that question needs to be answered and, and I'm uh, asking it of uh, state leaders. Uh, so it'll be interesting in the, in the days and weeks to come uh, what that looks like in LC. But uh, the short term result certainly wasn't good uh, for the students of that community because they didn't have school. Uh, I shouldn't say they didn't have school. Maybe they went virtual. Do you know that, Miss Marshall? I do not know. My understanding was that school was closed for today and tomorrow. Yeah. And again, it was just as a result of lack lack of staff. And I uh, I shouldn't say, I, I don't know if I bet my life on it, but if I made that announcement tonight, uh, we would not only have not enough staff to run four buildings, we might not have enough staff to run one building. So time will tell. And I will try to get, uh, if you email me that, you know, you want more information on whoever asked that question, when I get an answer to that, I'll certainly shoot you the email from uh, ODE or OHA that I get because it, it is one that we need to get answered. Okay. I'm not seeing any other questions. I'll hang on here a minute. Um, we do have a board meeting at 6.30. If you're interested in watching, it will be a little bit of a longer one. We have a school presentation tonight and uh, several items on the agenda. Um, and you should be able to find the link on the website. So with that, I appreciate those of you that showed up. Please spread the word that these meetings occur uh, every Monday. 5.30 on the night of our board meetings. Because if we had, you know, 27 people in here instead of seven, it helps get information out, if nothing else. So thanks again. Okay.